Oh, hi, hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, proudly here with an International Women's Day episode because I am me and this is the show. Sunday was International Women's Day. It's the day I'm recording this episode and the day that we talk about being ladies and renew our fervor to finally reach equality with the men. To be paid the same, to be treated the same, not to be discriminated against because of the fact that we're the ones that can have babies. Of course, today also refers to those women who can't have babies, our trans sisters, and anyone who identifies as a woman. Happy International Women's Day, badass ladies. And what better way to celebrate women than with an episode celebrating the strongest woman of Greek mythology, the one so strong, even the men loved her. Yes, today we're here to talk about everyone's favorite goddess, Pallas Athena. Okay, maybe not everyone's favorite, but definitely the favorite of the heroes and the Athenians and man, just countless others, but we don't need to list them. Regardless of the shit I talk about her decisions and actions in the mythology, Athena is one of my favorites for everything that she represents. I told you briefly about her in my epic list of Zeus's many, many victims and their resulting children, but there's more to Athena than that, and more to Athena than being the goddess who helps the heroes and not the women, or single-handedly ruined both Ariadne and Medusa. Like I said, I talk some shit about Athena, but I like to think I've also made pretty clear that while she can be problematic at times, much of that comes from the people behind her, the men of Athens who wanted her on their side and not on the side of the women who didn't have any power. It's not Athena's fault she's so popular. So today, we're going to talk about her history, her backstory, and some not-as-problematic stories that include this badass goddess of goddesses. Mini-myth behind the goddess, Pallas Athena. First off, a refresher on our girl's origins, because they are vital to everything about the way that she's portrayed throughout the mythology. Athena's mother is Metis, a titan. She represents the concept of thought, counsel, and wisdom. She was therefore important and powerful. Some say she was Zeus's so-called first wife, others one of his many conquests. Calling her his first wife seems like an awfully convenient way of making Athena's origins a bit less troubling. It's Hesiod who says that she's his wife, and if I remember anything about my mythology course in university and the awesome woman that I had as a professor, it's that Hesiod was the OG misogynist, really just hated women. Hesiod says that Zeus marries Metis, has sex with her, and then, just to be safe, lest she bear a child more powerful than he, he ate her. Then, it isn't until after he's married to Hera, moving on to his question mark number of wives, because I think Hesiod also says he married a bunch of other women, basically seeming like in order to uh, bear children, they were married anyway. It isn't until Zeus is with Hera that he births Athena fully grown from his head. Meanwhile, according to Apollodorus, Zeus had sex with Metis after she transformed herself many times in attempts to keep him from raping her. Ugh. But then he did, and then again swallowed her whole. In this case, it's because it's said that after she gave birth to the girl she was pregnant with then, then she would give birth to a boy more powerful than Zeus. It wouldn't be the woman, no. So many slight variations on the same tragic story. Zeus raped Metis, then swallowed her and eventually, via his head, gives birth to their daughter, Athena. This gives Athena wisdom and forethought, but also in many interpretations makes her a particularly strong and masculine woman, having been technically born from a man's head. The goddess of Warcraft and wisdom being technically born from a man's head, of all things, is incredibly telling when we look at how Athena was appreciated in relation to the other goddesses. Sure, she was a woman, but she wasn't particularly feminine, and she was born from a man, so the men could see themselves in her. 
It's why she was so well regarded and used in all the hero stories, whereas the other women tended more towards so-called womenly arts. Aphrodite had seduction and not many stories centering around her. Artemis had the hunt, which is pretty cool, but she's outwardly avoiding men at all costs, so while the goddess of the hunt, she wasn't really respected in the way Athena was. And Hera, of course, Hera had childbirth. Athena, though, was also the patron goddess of Athens amongst many, many other city-states in the ancient Greek world. She was an anomaly when examining female figures in the mythology, and I don't think it's coincidence that this anomaly was apparently birthed by a man. But regardless of all of that, she was a woman and a virgin, a woman who didn't need a man for herself. That in itself is incredibly powerful, and I like to hope something real women of ancient Greece could see and appreciate and maybe even see a future for themselves that didn't revolve around men and keeping their houses. We have so little from actual women, it's almost impossible to say, but such a powerful deity being a woman had to mean something to them as well as the men. That's all to say, while Athena has her flaws, I choose to see her existence as important for women and as meaning something to them. I do love Athena, even if I do also like to point out that so much of her personality in the stories is there to benefit men and to harm women. If she were real, I'm confident she would have been a badass feminist doing all she could to help the women of the ancient world. And this turned into something I didn't intend, so let's get back to the real point of this episode. Why do we call her Pallas Athena? Or in often in the case of ancient sources, just Pallas. For instance, in my translation of the Aeneid, she's almost exclusively referred to by that name. I've tried avoiding it in my stories overall for the sake of confusion, because the ancient Greeks and their gods had so many epithets and nicknames that unless you've memorized them all, it can be really hard to keep track of who you're actually talking about. Don't even get me started about how often I've had to make an effort to use the name Venus instead of the Catharian goddess, as she's been referred to in the Aeneid, about as often as Minerva is called Pallas. I keep writing Athena when I see Pallas, and then I have to remind myself, no, we're in Roman times, live, call her Minerva. I'm ranting now. The point I'm trying to make here is why is she called Pallas, even though I usually filter that out when I'm talking to you guys? Well, by some accounts of Athena's birth and childhood, it said that once she was born, one assumes fully, or in this case, mostly grown, she was brought to Triton, the son of Poseidon, where she was raised with his daughter, Pallas. Together, the two young goddesses in training learned the art of Warcraft. Specifically, they spar against each other, training in combat. Just going to dwell on this for a moment. There's an instance of two women learning combat together. It's not the most well-known story of Athena, even though her name, Pallas Athena, is widespread and used in almost all ancient sources that reference her. It's used more than the name Athena, really. But I had to dig for this, and all too often it's like two lines with not much about what they're learning together. And to be clear, there are minor alternatives as to why she's named Pallas, but that one of them involves two young women learning men's skills is pretty fucking cool. Of course, it wouldn't be a story about two women without tragedy. Together, the two young goddesses, Athena and Pallas, trained in the art of Warcraft, training in combat as they sparred. And once, when they were doing this, Pallas is about to land a blow to Athena, which one could imagine Athena could handle just fine. But men were there. Zeus was there watching the two as they fought, and he was a jumpy father. Athena was his prize, after all. In a panic, when Pallas is about to land this blow on Athena, Zeus places his aegis, his shield, or possibly sometimes a cloak, in between Pallas and Athena. It causes her to be distracted, to look in the wrong direction, to lose her concentration. And that distraction causes Athena to land an accidental but fatal blow to Pallas. Athena didn't mean to. It was a horrible mistake caused by Zeus thinking these two young women couldn't handle themselves, didn't have it completely under control. Athena was so upset by what happened, what she'd done, that she took the name of Pallas before her own and created a wooden statue of the girl that she put the Aegis on in memory of her. She called it the Palladian or sometimes the Palladium. 
Eventually, the statue ended up in Troy. It's not entirely clear how, except it seems it probably included a victim of Zeus's finding refuge at the statue and him subsequently throwing it down in Troy. It seems to prevent women he rapes from finding refuge there again. Ah, that Zeus, don't we love him? You may remember the Palladium from the Trojan War episodes. It was at one point stolen by Odysseus, I believe, but frankly, I don't remember the details. I can confirm simply it was a thing. I wish I could remember everything I've said in the past, but I'm no goddess of wisdom. That, friends, is how Apollodorus tells the story of Athena and Pallas in the Library of Greek Mythology. But there's more to it historically. The story comes from ancient Libya, which basically accounts for all of North Africa that wasn't Egypt. It said that there was a group of people there who worshipped a form of Athena. They believed that this Athena was a daughter of Triton, who they connected to Poseidon, and not necessarily a son of Poseidon like in the Greek, but Poseidon himself. They believed her to be the daughter of Poseidon and a goddess of a saltwater lake in the region that they called Tritonus, but that they associated with Amphitrite, Poseidon's wife. There's a lot of names here. Essentially, they worshipped Athena, but they gave her a backstory that made her special to their region and not simply a goddess with her origins all the way over in Athens. It was common then to adapt stories to fit your needs regionally. According to Herodotus, in his histories, and therefore something he presented to be real, something that he learned during his extensive travels of the Mediterranean, these people had an annual festival in worship of Athena, where they would gather all the young girls of the region, probably unmarried virgins. The girls would be separated into two groups, and, like Pallas and Athena, they would fight each other. But unlike Pallas and Athena, this wasn't training or harmless. These girls would legitimately fight each other with stones and sticks. This was supposed to be in honor of their Athena and probably wasn't quite as troubling and disturbing as it sounds to us now, but who knows? That said, according to Herodotus, the girls who died of their wounds from these battles were called false virgins. What that means isn't totally clear, but it doesn't sound great. Add to that, apparently, before the fighting began, the people would pick a favorite, the fairest girl, that's how she's described, and she would get a Corinthian helmet and armor, basically setting her above everyone else and making her quite literally the favorite, both to win and of the people. She'd have quite the advantage. Herodotus goes so far as to question where these people would have even gotten the armor before the Greeks moved so close by, as he assumes that before the Greeks lived there, it would have been the Egyptians providing them with this this armor, suggesting that these people have been doing this for a very long time. Dark? Absolutely. But anything added by Herodotus is always fascinating. Of course, we don't know how just how accurate he was in his accounts, and certainly he'd be biased as he's Not only because he was a Greek, who inherently believed the Greeks to be pretty great, but he also didn't fully comprehend his bias in most things, just by nature of who he was and the world he was in. That's all to say, grain of salt, but Herodotus was the first official historian, and he did account for a lot of things with real accuracy. Plus, he's the reason we have so much information about so many things from the ancient world. Like, honestly, thank God for Herodotus' curiosity and his ability to travel the region, learning and writing things down like he did. A true hero. Much like... Pallas Athena. Oh, nerds, thank you all for listening um, to this little mini myth about our girl Athena. She is the best. Reading and researching about all this Herodotus stuff has reminded me about the episode I did I did a while back now um, about women in Herodotus. You should go listen to it because that was really fun too. So it was like historical women that Herodotus talked about in his histories. Because to be clear, Herodotus, while you know we don't know everything about him or just how accurate he was, he was a man who sought out to be a historian when that wasn't a thing. He traveled all around talking to people and learning things and writing things down and learning things from well beyond the Greek world. He really respected the Egyptians and just kind of everyone in that area. It's fucking fascinating because he was an ancient person learning all of this stuff and then we get to read his perspective. Now, I could go on, you know me. Anyway, 
the usual. Please rate, review, subscribe. Um, if you love this podcast and you have some extra money to throw around, consider becoming a patron. I just released an episode all about ancient Greek theater, which was really interesting. And I've put up some new tiers that are maybe a bit more appealing to people and a bit more exciting. I'm doing my best without the time to include super loads extra bonus content because um there's only so many hours in the day as much as I wish we had these like 30 hour days where I could just do everything all the time <sighs> anyway I'm rambling now thank you all you're all the best I am Liv and I love this shit <laughs>